Well, thank you all for coming to our, uh, I guess it's our third this year of our evening events to try to really take some of the great expertise that we have on our faculty and our uh, people affiliated with Penn and to really try to bring it to other audiences. Uh, I have, we have today's, uh, actually topics is, you know, today's theme is hot topics in antitrust and I uh, am delighted to welcome uh, two of my very close friends, but also my favorite colleagues and um, uh, people, the scholars who I respect the most in the country on these topics, that is Herb Hovenkamp and Joshua Wright. Herb, as of course, is, is a uh, professor, a university professor here at Penn, and Josh has chosen to grace the University of Pennsylvania Law School by being one of our Modell visiting uh, former distinguished fellows from practice, having served recently as a commissioner of the Federal Trade Commission. Um, what's fascinating to me is um, just three months ago, Brian Leiter, as is his want, uh, is always doing rankings of different kinds. And one of the things they did is he studied citations by field. And we have with us today the number one, the first and the second most cited professed faculty in the country on antitrust from the span of 2013 to 17. Uh, anyone who follows these fields already knew that without having to let Brian Leiter tell us. Um, there are many positive things I can t say about them, but um, my favorite quote of, about Herb is one that Justice Breyer once met, that he said that he, most litigants would prefer to have two paragraphs of uh, Herb's treatise on their side than three courts of appeals or four Supreme Court justices. I think it's a credit that it's four. If it was five, that would have been really impressive. But, um, and um, the thing that struck me is, in, in Josh is stepping down from his position at the commission, there was a tremendous outpouring of support uh, from uh, the Senate. Uh, obviously, the Senate Antitrust Committee, the chair and the ranking member, both said, uh, uh, commended Joshua's service and really sent, uh, made a lovely message about his contributions to the commission. What was really quite striking to me is Amy Klobuchar, saw fit to issue a separate statement even on top of that, really acknowledging Josh's service, even though um, I'll venture a guess that uh, Senator Klobuchar and you, Josh, didn't always see eye to eye on every single issue, but I think it's a sign of the respect that you've engendered throughout, uh, across the entire politics, and I think is a wonderful sign about how integrity to the issues can, how, can increase nonpartisanship and that, you know, good government and a healthy debate about that regardless of where are the issues is just is critically important in this day and age. The other thing I'm openly envious of both of them is they've both had symposia done on their legacies. And uh, as an academic, you can only hope to have that done someday. Um, they clearly both warrant it. And um, I'm not fishing here, but if that ever happened to me, I'd be thrilled. Anyway. <laughs> Um, so I want to start off with you just to, to, tell, to quote a blog post that you made, Josh, a number of years ago that said, what happened to antitrust scholarship? We were in this huge doldrums, antitrust wasn't hot. That seems to no longer be true. Um, I'd love to get your thoughts on the change of what, how, why is antitrust so much in the news and so hot these days? And really, has it gone away and come back? And I'll ask Herb, is maybe that's, Herb's been doing this all along. Maybe it never went anywhere, and it's just all of us were wrong. So the doubt, thank you, by the way, and, and for the very kind introduction. And uh, it is a, um, a, a great honor to share the stage with, with Herb. I don't think we've done on a, a panel together be before. But um, so it's a lot of fun for me. So thank you all for, for, for having me. Um, the downside of having a blog is you write stuff that people impeach you with later. Uh, so, so, I, so I was wrong. But you're um, happy to be impeached by this. I am happy to be impeached by this. I, so by my lights, um, I mean, this is probably uh, the easiest thing to start with is this is the most interesting time, I think, for antitrust as a, a matter of sort of public uh, politics and policy salience during, during my career. Uh, but I think it's also, uh, there's been a spike in the academic world as well. So I, I started as a professor in 2004 at, at uh, then George Mason Law. And what I was told by my academic advisors was, don't say you're an antitrust guy. Tell everyone you do corporate law, because that's where the jobs are, man. Um, and I said, well, I don't. So I don't know anything about corporate law, so no. 
I'm not going to say that. And they said, well, you'll figure it out if you get there. You, like, say business judgment rule a lot, and it'll be okay. Um, I said, no, nah, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to say I'm, a, I'm an antitrust guy, but the perspective on a lot of faculties at the time was the sort of oversimplified, caricatured view of antitrust was it died in the 80s uh, during the Reagan administration and was maybe just starting to come back. I think on the ground, something very different was happening. You had... Um, 30, 40 years ago, there's four or five antitrust authorities in the world that matter. There's 130 something now um, in the world, sort of national level competition authorities, maybe two dozen of which have a really serious impact on the day to day sort of global practice of antitrust law. Um, that was sort of one phenomenon going on. At the same time, you had the rise of IP and antitrust sort of as a separate uh, standalone field, and a lot of law schools sort of taught as a, as a separate course. Um, you had sort of exogenous changes in the structure of the economy, moving from manufacturing to technology and uh, the rise of software and all of that sort of fun stuff, changing the shape of the size of, sort of the firm distribution size and lots of things that have antitrust implications sort of all happened in the, in the late 90s, early 2000s. And I think what we've got now is sort of a combination of those things coming together in a way uh, that has made both the practice of antitrust, um, antitrust academia, and antitrust and politics sort of both all sort of interesting um, at, at, at the same time. So it's been a, a lot of fun to be a part of. I think there are some new issues raised, some of the same issues being raised again. Uh, but I, I will tell you, for both an antitrust academic and uh, to be in the agency at sort of a time like this, I think it's... Uh, it is a great time to be thinking about uh, antitrust issues kind of from, from any angle. Herb? Yeah, I, I agree with uh, all of that. Uh, just add a couple of things. Um, I think there have been three kind of developments around the periphery of antitrust that have really sparked the big interest. One is major advances in economics in the last 20 or so years, and there are more and more economists writing antitrust uh, Non-economists are becoming uh, more sophisticated about antitrust, and there's been a real uh, economics antitrust revolution. The other big growth uh, industry has been uh, intellectual property and technology. If you go back and look at Bork's antitrust uh, paradox, there's one <coughs> paragraph about pa patents in it. Uh, today, antitrust is all, so much of it is all about patents and technology, networks. Uh, these things are challenging. A lot of people who thought antitrust was dull are uh, pursuing them for, for that reason. And also, there's a lot more uh, humanitarian interest in antitrust, uh, which is somewhat more problematic in some senses. There are more legal historians writing about competition policy today, uh, and there are more people who are questioning uh, the economic foundations of, of antitrust today. So, you know, while, while I don't necessarily agree with all of these people, I think uh, it's really remarkable how big the increase in interest in antitrust law has become. Well, part of that increase in interest is reflected by activity at the Supreme Court. Uh, I thought that we uh, talk about uh, a case that was decided last June at the end of the last term, which is uh, Ohio versus American Express. Uh, this is a case that's interestingly featured amicus briefs from scholars, one of which was signed in support of the respondents by Josh and one signed by the support, the, in support of the petitioners by Herb. And so I thought that this would be an excellent chance for us to talk about uh, the significance of this case because many people regard Amex, given its focus on what are known as two-sided markets, may be one of the most important decisions for the, what we call the platform economy, which is growing in terms of importance. Uh, since I started with Josh first, why don't I talk to you, Herb, um, your thoughts on the Amex case in terms of uh, you, you were on the side that you thought the Supreme Court got it wrong. Yeah. Um, okay. A, a two -side, let's start with a two-sided market. A two-sided market is a, is a platform uh, that... Uh, operates so as to balance and uh, tran facilitate transactions between two sides. I'll, I'll give you the simple example because you're all familiar with it of Uber, right? Uber is an algorithm that creates a two-sided platform. Uh, it has to meter prices uh, for two reasons. If prices are too low, 
then you'll get plenty of riders, but not enough drivers. Uh, if prices are too high, you'll get plenty of drivers, but not enough riders. Uh, and furthermore, uh, the pricing has to balance out demand and supply at different times of the day. So perhaps higher prices during rush hour, for, for example. And so the, the object of the platform in that case is to uh, connect those two groups of people and then balance out transactions uh, between them. Now, at the kind of at the atmospheric level, uh, we say that uh, the operation of a platform balances gains on one side and losses on the other side. Uh, that's the approach Justice Thomas took in his majority opinion in the. Uh, in, in the in the Amex case, uh, and that's true for some cases where the real issue is what is the source of revenue. For example, Wallace versus IBM, a Seventh Circuit case, involved a situation where IBM gave away software, uh, but only to people who purchased mainframe computers from it that used that software. And Wallace, the plaintiff, had brought a predatory pricing case claiming that a price of zero on the software was predatory. And uh, the obvious answer was, well, you can't really just look at the price of software to determine uh, whether there was predatory pricing. You had to look at the revenue from both sides of the market. Now, uh, Amex is different because it involves a, an exclusionary practice somewhat akin to exclusive dealing or most favored nation clause, uh, which was an anti-steering rule, which forbade merchants from offering uh, Amex customers a discount for switching to a different card, like Visa or, or MasterCard. So, Herb, before you go, can I get you to lay out the two sides of the credit card market? To make yeah, sure? yes, okay, thank you. Yeah, uh, okay, and one side is the merchants and the merchant acceptance side. Merchants take the cards and they receive, uh, and, they, and they pay merchant acceptance uh, fees to Amex for taking the card. On the other side, card users, Amex card holders, they use the card. They don't pay anything. In fact, they get perks. They get travel perks. They might get warranties with products that they buy from the card and so on. And so uh, they don't usually get charged unless uh, there's an interest fee or something like that. But for the most part, their, their fees to Amex are, are zero. So you do have this balancing in, in that sense. Uh, in order to understand the Amex case, you have to understand that competition exists at the margin. Uh, and that was the mistake Thomas made in his opinion. He looked at the fact that overall, uh, Amex card users might benefit mo enough to justify the higher fees. Amex's fees were roughly 50% more than uh, Visa's and MasterCard's fees. Uh, and that's very likely true. Otherwise, Amex business model would have fallen apart if nobody, uh, nobody favored those fees. By the way, I've, uh, much of what I'm saying I got from an, an article by Eric, my son here, who, who's been doing quite a bit of writing about, about this subject. Uh, the question in Amex, however, was the impact of this anti-steering rule that forbade Amex customers uh, from uh, accepting an invitation from a merchant to use a different card. The merchant was forbidden from making that invitation. Uh, and the question was whether there was a benefit and an offsetting burden. Uh, Justice Thomas held that there was and that the only way you could uh, evaluate that was by defining a single market that included both sides. I think he got that wrong. Uh, in fact, if if you you should look at this problem, you know, just the way Coase would look at it and the nature of the firm. Break it down to individual transactions and ask what is the impact of each transaction. Well, in this case, uh, the uh, customer would have liked to use a cheaper card and the merchant would have given the customer an inducement in the form of a lower, uh, a lower, uh, a lower product price. For example, if, if the Amex fee was uh, $30 and the Visa fee was $20, uh, the merchant might say, well, I'll give you a $6 discount if you use, uh, if you use a Visa or MasterCard instead of uh, Amex. So, uh, by denying the merchant and the cardholder the opportunity to, to make that deal, 
uh, basically, the merchant was losing. The merchant was losing the right to make that lower price transaction. The cardholder, however, was also losing. That's the one thing Thomas didn't see. The cardholder was also losing because it lost the opportunity to get that better deal by taking the product discount. So that particular cardholder was worse off as a result of the anti-steering rule, okay? So the merchant was worse off, the cardholder was worse off. Who profited from uh, Amex's rule? Well, Amex as the operator of the platform profited, uh, not either of the two sides. Amex as the operator of the platform profited. However, it profited simply by taking that sale away from the alternative platform. That is, Amex got one more sale Visa or MasterCard, whatever the alternative would have been, got one uh, less sale. And furthermore, uh, the Amex transaction was at a much higher price than the uh, Visa transaction. So the question was whether uh, the government made out a prima facie case, which is basically enough of a case, uh, so that the burden should have shifted to the defendant to offer some kind of defense of its anti-steering rule. And there's a pretty important reason we want to do that, which is that uh, Amex created the steering rule. Burdens of proof on defenses should go to the person who created the rule or practice that requires uh, the defense. Uh, but the majority did not see it that way. They held that there was this uh, burden and this offsetting benefit incorrectly, and as a result, uh, the government failed to make out its prima facie case and they dismissed the complaint. That, that was a long speech. There are other horrible errors, laughable errors in the Amex opinion. Uh, and maybe we can talk about those a little later, but I'll, uh, I'll stop for now. So Josh, did the Supreme Court get it wrong? Mostly no. Um, I think Herb and I will end up probably agreeing on some of the laughable, er laughable errors being at least errors. Um, but in terms of, so let me sort of go back uh, um, sort of to the beginning of the, the story a little bit. You know, d dealing with multi-sided markets has been something uh, that has been increasingly common for courts and agencies over the past uh, sort of 20 years or, or so. Um, there's an interesting trend that's sort of going on at the same time in I know, conventional standard antitrust analysis outside of multi-sided markets, you know, one store, right, selling, you know, Coca-Cola selling you, you know, soda at the store, uh, which is increasingly, when this sort of revolution of economists happens in antitrust, the focus is more and more on trying to directly assess the competitive effects of the conduct at issue because we have the tools to do it, right? So in most of antitrust, we do... Uh, rule of reason, we're trying to show um, the plaintiff's job in its prima facie case structured different ways in different cases is to show uh, that the conduct at issue generated anti-competitive effects. And we mean something sort of specific by that. We mean um, antitrust is not about uh, policing all of the things that make any group of consumers or any individual worse off or better off. It is about exercises of monopoly power or the acquisition of monopoly power. It's sort of a subset of stuff that is bad uh, that can happen uh, to consumers. And so we more and more often throughout antitrust try to analyze that conduct uh, directly. In single-sided cases, this is not, tr some of these issues that arise in Amex are uh, not tremendously interesting, but I want to make the comparison so you can help sort of highlight a little bit um, what the stakes are in the Amex decision, what it covers and doesn't in terms of its, its scope. So if I'm evaluating an exclusive dealing contract for Coca-Cola, I'm going to ask questions like, what ha did Coca-Cola successfully reduce the output of Coca-Cola and raise the price? Like, that's what a monopolist does. I want to know if it could successfully do that because that makes consumers worse off. If yes, plaintiff's going to satisfy its burden, it's going to shift to Coca-Cola to justify its, its conduct, but that's the way we're going to structure the analysis. In multi-sided market cases, we've got a little bit of a puzzle to solve because you've got different groups of consumers on different sides of the market. In Amex, maybe I've got two in, uh, uh, you know, search engines and the like. I might have a, an advertising side and a user side. I might have a hardware side and an advertising side and a user side. 
And so in those types of cases, antitrust, when it's doing this uh, competitive effects analysis, uh, faces the question of, well, do I count all of those sides up at once? Can a plaintiff win by showing harm to any one of those sides? If there's nine sides, does a plaintiff win by showing harm to one group of users on one of the nine sides and then we shift the burden? Right? So you can answer those questions uh, a variety of ways. The Supreme Court was asked um, to think about a couple of ways uh, to answer those questions. Uh, I think in part of, of Herb's answer was the, the reading of the opinion that what it says the plaintiff's got to do is essentially uh, show that netting out both sides the conduct's harmed uh, competition. I don't think that that's um, incorrect. I think that that's what current antitrust law requires and I think that that's right and here, here's why. Um, there's lots of conduct in the world that antitrust governs so um, just about any contract is sort of subject to the jurisdiction of Section 1 of the Sherman Act. We have tying arrangements, exclusive dealing, mergers, almost any of those examples. Um, resale price maintenance. Coca-Cola, because I used them earlier uh, and I have caffeine on my mind. Um, Coca-Cola tells a supermarket, we'd like you to price our product above a dollar. Right? It sells the product to the retailer for 80 cents. It says, you're going to sell it above um, for above a dollar. We're going to sort of guarantee you a 20 cent margin because maybe they're trying to get the supermarket to promote the product or put up some ads or something. Put it on the eye level shelf space, something that's valuable to some subset of consumers. You tie razors and blades together. You, you underprice the razor, you overprice the blades. You make a bunch more on people who are heavy shavers than light shavers. Right? Um, lots of ways that firms structure pricing that ends up harming some consumer. So in that Coca-Cola arrangement, if you're the consumer who really likes Coca-Cola no matter what, they put it on the eye level, the bottom of the shelf, they put it with the chicken, you're going to go find it and get it, you will never ever drink Pepsi, it's a fairly good life choice, uh, Coke is better. So if you do that, um, you are worse off, right? You're paying for those promotional services, but you don't care about them. You're not consuming those promotional services. The, the razors and blades, sort of standard way you sell razors and blades. You underprice the razor, you overprice the blades. Uh, the heavy shavers pay more over time right, uh, than the light users. Somebody's worse off. Um, Starbucks decides to give you, uh, um, you know, you buy the coffee, you get the, the Wi-Fi and the, the cream for free. Right? Depending on how you value those things, you might have preferred cheaper coffee and let the people using the Wi-Fi pay for it. Somebody's sort of made, made worse off. What antitrust says is um, we're not in the hunt for individuals that are made worse off by conduct. We're about the exercise of monopoly power. And so the plaintiff's prima facie burden in cases is tied to um, showing that effects occurred that are the exercise, they're what monopolists do, reduce output, increase the price. That is sort of econ 101. The trick here is that in a multi-sided market case, you correctly ask, and the court correctly asks, well, what, what market and what price? There's some users over here, there's some users over there, um, there might be four sides. What market and what price are we talking about? My view, um, the standard antitrust answer is what we try to do in the plaintiff's pre prima facie burden is have the plaintiff show that the conduct resulted in an effect that is something that monopolists do. Right, it's the exercise of, of monopoly power. Two really important facts underlie the Amex dispute that I think help, um, they won't make the conceptual issues about how antitrust wants to do its accounting across sides uh, any less important. They're really important issues and I'm going to end up agreeing that I don't think the Supreme Court did a great job in resolving them. But for the actual case in front of it, and I trust we can sort of quibble over the market share required to show a firm's got monopoly power. Amex's share was somewhere in the 20s. Relatively, uh, when you think of the monopolist in the credit card market, I want to see if Amex comes to your mind first. Go. Um, and what does a monopolist do? It reduces output and increases the price. Right? That's sort of Econ 101. There's a little bit of a fight in the litigation record, um, and we can talk about it if people are interested, about the, uh, interested in the details. But one thing you can do when the two-sided or three-sided, when the multi-sided market is credit cards, 
You can't do this in my Google example where it's users and ads because you got apples and oranges. Right? But for transactional platforms, it's Uber. I'm connecting a driver to a rider and I can measure the number of rides. Right? Um, credit cards, I'm measuring credit card volume, right? the volume of transactions. The evidence in the record is that comparing before and after Amex introduced the steering arrangement, output went up. Now, there's a fun fight to be had among um, expert witnesses in the case, and I, I don't think that this fight got aired enough and it would have been useful for the record. You know, did it go up because of the restraint or not um, is a discussion that I don't think is adequately answered in the record and is a little bit of an open question. And maybe um, the Supreme Court relied upon it more than it should given the sort of state at which that debate was aired. But remember, in the normal antitrust case, it is the burden of the plaintiff to show that output went down or prices went up or some showing consistent, any showing consistent uh, with the exercise of monopoly power. Um, I think that on the ground that makes Amex a far less interesting case uh, in practice than it is in theory. In theory, I think there are a lot of important things to say about the way we do the accounting of effects in these cases. Um, but the hypothetical to ask, and I think one that uh, happened during the oral argument in the case, is uh, sort of based on the following, which is could a platform that we all agree does not have market power generate the same effects as Amex did? Meaning some group on some side is going to be left worse off. And the answer is yes, because of the nature of the economics of platforms. I'm balancing demand on both sides, and most decisions, right, because there's spillovers between the sides, are going to render some users on some side worse off than they would be otherwise. If that's enough to win your antitrust case, uh, one, I think that's a different approach than we have in the rest of antitrust. Uh, to what is in the plaintiff's prima facie burden. But to me, uh, I think most of the case comes down to what do we mean by anti-competitive effect. And if we mean um, a showing that's something a monopolist can do that a competitive firm can't do, broadly construed, uh, then I think the Supreme Court did just fine. Uh, in actual application, I have a little bit of a hard time um, some of the criticisms of the case and, and not the one um, that you heard from Professor Hovenkamp, but some of the criticisms of the case are a lot of heavy breathing that the case creates some sort of immunity in the antitrust laws for platforms. I think it's a little bit, uh, a little bit overwrought. I, in the case in front of them, they had a firm with a 20% market share and evidence in the record, imperfect as it was, that output went up, not down. That, you know, uh, to me, I think, um, should inform how we interpret uh, the Supreme Court decision. So, as, you know, and as imperfect as some of uh, the bits of the opinion are and some of the open questions that they leave, uh, I think it's disappointing. They talk a lot about treating transactional platforms in a different way, I mean, but they don't tell you uh, on what basis. I think there are a lot of points where the decision could have been approved, but um, by my lights, it is a, sort of a standard application of Section 1. Please. Yeah. Um there was an explicit fact finding by the district court that merchant prices were higher when they took the American Express card because the higher costs of using the card had to be spread to all the customers. And the effect of the anti-steering rule was that those prices went up because more, more people were using the Amex card. Uh, so. And the district court also said that that issue was heavily litigated, but it made a fact finding that prices were higher uh, under, the, under the steering rule. Now, what the majority did was ignored the fact finding. And I think that's one of the most egregious problems raised in American Express. You know, we've, we divide antitrust analysis into per se and rule of reason uh, and the result is that in per se cases, we very considerably trim down the amount of fact finding that's necessary. Uh, but rule of reason depends on uh, thorough investigation and fact finding under a defined district court record. There's one reference 
in Justice Thomas's entire opinion, there's one reference to the record, uh, and it in an issue that has nothing to do with the with the with the merits of the case. I think that's a real atrocity, and I think that's why uh, Josh may have the attitude he does. There was a district court finding about higher prices. The problem is that the the uh, Supreme Court. Uh, didn't recognize it at all. They didn't set it aside, but they, they simply ignored it. So let me, let me try uh, uh, my, a, a theory I have about this case. And just, I'm gonna clarify. So you wanna say, there are four major credit cards, Visa, MasterCard, Amex, and Discover. Discover will just, it's 5%, it's trivia. So there's really three cards. And Visa and MasterCard are held by far more people. In fact, I'm personify this. I have a Visa and two MasterCards in my wallet as me speak. There is no Amex in my wallet. There used to be, I dropped it. Many more stores take Visa and MasterCard. On a transactional basis, Visa is the market leader at 35-ish percent. Both Amex, in terms of total transactions, not in terms of card holders or merchants, both MasterCard and Amex clock in at number, around number two, around 25%. So Amex, even though it has many fewer cardholders and many fewer stores, is generating roughly the same number of transactions as MasterCard. How are they doing it? They charge merchants more. They give higher perks to cardholders because that's the incentive that they're trying to create. And it's an in interesting decision by them on a business strategy to try to generate um, the same number of transactions as MasterCard with many, many fewer places. And the question becomes is that, as Herb says, let's, say that, let's take his fact finding in the record that the consumer prices they paid were actually higher. We combine that with the fact that Josh gives us that total transactions went up. The interpretation you can give of that is that yes, consumers wanted, were willing to, on balance, purchased more at a higher price product that gave them more perks, that is free flights or whatever perk they're getting on the side. Why? Because their total purchases, number of quantities, transactions went up. And that what this is is a competition on quality. That Amex is offering a higher quality, so we normally think of high prices, the measure is uh, of bad is lower prices and higher quantities. If you're competing on quality, what you would expect is prices to go up. Why? You want a higher price quality bundle, but the real measure then is what happened to transactions, and as long as transactions went up, then this is by def uh, as the, the, the hallmarks of being something to be good for consumers. And I would love to have your reactions to that. That's an example of the static market fallacy, which is looking at the whole market and then assessing a relationship between the market and, and uh, a, particu a particular practice. Markets aren't static. The fact is all output went up. Cash transactions also went up. They weren't affected by any element of the of the uh, of of the credit card market, but just to return to a point I make earlier, competition exists at the margin, and so the question is not whether Amex cardholders as a group were uh, well served by paying high fees for high perks. The question is what was the impact on those people who were affected by the uh, anti-steering rule, and those were the people who would have changed. That is, the people who would have changed but for the anti-steering rule. They were the ones who were worse off. And, uh, and that included not a benefit on one side of the platform and a burden on the other side. No, that was a harm to the merchants who wanted to offer uh, a compensation for steering and also to those customers who would have preferred to be steered away had they known, had they known about it, but whom the anti-steering rule prevented. So then you've got harm on both sides of the platform. You've got all the harm you need. Uh, that certainly should have been enough to uh, switch the burden of proof to the defendant to justify its rule. Okay, so a couple of, a, a couple of things. Um, that all effects, all effects on the margin matter and an effect on the increase in, I mean, 
if the Amex users were made better off because of the rule, uh, the fact that they are well served, if their surplus goes up because of the rule, I don't see any reason why in a welfare calculus that doesn't matter. We, we have examples like this. Um, so I mean, I think if my interpretation was there are harm on bo both sides, it's a super easy case, right? Because there's nothing, there's nothing to balance. Um, I obviously don't, don't think that, um, and either did the Supreme Court, and I think for good reason. If you think about, uh, let me go back to my Coca-Cola example, because I think it meshes onto the point that you're making, uh, Christopher. The normal reason we think about why Coca-Cola would set a minimum price is because they're trying to induce the supermarket or the retailer to do some promotion that's going to serve some Coca-Cola customers, but not others. It's a sort of an effectively a way of price discrimination, right? Uh, the people who want to consume that promotion consume it. It shifts out their demand. Uh, you know, normally eye-level shelf space worth about three, four uh, percent in, in in the supermarket, and that's not because you and I it's worth something because we go down to the bottom, get the Coke, or we get it wherever it is. Um, it's a valuable service. The Supreme Court has a discussion of this in, in Legion and in the Legion, uh, uh, the Supreme Court case governing uh, the type of conduct I'm talking about, where they say, well, goodness, when you institute RPM, prices go up, and doesn't that mean uh, bad things for overall welfare? And the right economic answer is no. If demand increases, I get a price increase and output goes up. If an anti-competitive thing is going on and it's exercise of monopoly power, price goes up and output goes down. You can't and in multi-sided markets, the signal that the price makes is even noisier because you've got you know, demand moving over here has an effect on consumers over here. The reason, and I think this is a, a productive thing for the Supreme Court, among other things that I think uh, maybe they could have done, done better, the focus on output as a unit of currency that you can use to measure some of these things when you've got complicated questions across sides, I think is a very important step forward. If used, for example, in the RPM cases, if a plaintiff can come in and say, yeah, you put in these RPM resale price maintenance contracts and increase the price of Coca-Cola, um, if they're pro-competitive, that's what they're supposed to do. If they're anti-competitive, that's what they're supposed to do. What I want the plaintiff's prima facie burden to do uh, is to distinguish between pro-competitive and anti-competitive stuff. It turns out for certain types of conduct, Price is a less valuable signal, a less va uh, accurate predictor of overall welfare than other things. I think in multi the multi-sided market context, uh, that's certainly, and I think pretty well established in the economics literature, that's certainly one of those um, one of those market structures, one of those phenomena where I don't look at price as a particularly valuable predictor, at least not not in this setting. If you gave me a cartel or something, I, I would think differently about it. Um, so to me, uh, the fact finding on, on price in this context um, doesn't, doesn't move me the way that it would in a different case uh, because what I'm interested in overall economic welfare, and that includes the welfare of um, Amex users who like access to stuffy airport lounges or whatever they get, I don't know. Well, I guess uh, the, this dialogue explains or highlights why this was a five to four decision on the Supreme Court. It was very closely divided. A lot of people uh, disagree, including um, the Supreme Court very sharply. I'm sure it's not the last thing we've heard about this. Um, I, um, w it's, it's interesting. Um, we are graced with not only a Supreme Court case last term, but a current one this term. And it's not every year we get one, in fact. Uh, the case of Apple versus Pepper was argued in front of the Supreme Court just last week. And this is a, a very current issue. It's a rather technical and somewhat obscure one. But um, if I can try to set the stage, um, one of the interesting questions we have is, um, if you have multiple, most chains of production have multiple purchasers, that a, someone manufactures a shoe and they sell it to a distributor who sells it to a retailer who sells it to an end consumer. And if the argument is that somewhere in that chain of people, someone acted in a monopolistic way and caused prices to go up, who gets to sue? So we have a rule under the Supreme Court in uh, Illinois BRIC that only the direct purchaser gets to sue. 
That is, if the conduct was done by the manufacturer, the wholesaler can sue, but not the retailer or the end consumer. Or if the retailer was a monopolist, the end user gets to sue, but not the people upstream. And we have a case involving Apple this year and app stores, which is you have an app store world where the app store sells its products. Well, you're going to have to help me with this, Herb, because you're more of an expert in the Illinois brick than anyone I know, having written a Harvard Law Review article. The question is, in a chain of production of an app store where you have the app store manufacturer and the app, the app manufacturer, the app store runner, and Apple, who gets to sue whom? and whether that violates the direct purchaser rule. Well, that was a question in the case, is whether the, the uh, direct purchaser was the uh, sellers of the applications and the customers were producing from them. Rather, that would make them indirect purchasers from Apple. So there are, the argument of the case is that the, per, the app manufacturer sold it to Apple and Apple sold it to the consumers? That's not what the defendant said. The yep. defendant said you'd have to treat the customers as indirect purchasers from, uh, from Apple because they purchased from the App Store manufacturers, uh, even though their money went to Apple and then Apple took out its 30% 30 cent, 30 commission and passed the balance on. It's one of many cases. Do you mind if I please? Okay, okay. It's one of many cases that involve irregularities that Illinois Brick didn't contemplate. Illinois Brick was your kind of standard hardware case. Hardware was bricks and cement blocks, but cement blocks go from the manufacturer to an intermediary, like a dealer. In this case, contractors, and then from the contractors to the customer. Uh, and the Supreme Court basically said the direct purchaser, the first buyer, should have the entire damages action, which is based on the overcharge or the difference between a cartel price and the, uh, and the, and the competitive price. Uh, the, the case, the, the logic works less well when you've got complications in the distribution chain. Ticketmaster, for example, acts as a venue, as a, as a broker for venues that put on concerts. And so uh, the customer pays the money to Ticketmaster. Ticketmaster then uh, passes on everything less its fee to the venue. And then we have to decide whether the customer is a direct purchaser from the venue or from uh, or from, or from Ticketmaster. I'll, just to give you my own two cents worth, and then I'll shut up. I think Illinois Brick was wrongly decided right from the beginning. Uh, it was based on a misconception. It was a misconception that Landis, Bill Landis and Richard Post, po <coughs> Posner developed that uh, damages could only be estimated by computing pass on. That is, how much gets passed on when a high price goes from a manufacturer to a retailer and from a retailer to a dealer. And it turns out that's a, that's a technical question. It has to do with the elasticity of supply facing the retailer at the top and of demand at the bottom. The fact is experts don't measure overcharge in that way when they compute damages. They use other kinds of tools, like they use, for example, something called the yardstick method, where they compare the price in one market with the price in another market, and they look at two parallel markets, and there's no pass on that has to be uh, that that has to be computed. So the so the computational rationale for Illinois Brick never worked very well. Secondly, uh, the states didn't like Illinois Brick. In fact, 25 of the 50 states have now uh, created either by legislation or judicial decision Illinois Brick repealers that have permitted passed on damages uh, in those cases. And the U.S. Supreme Court has upheld those state antitrust statutes that have done just that. And the result is we have created what amounts to a litigation nightmare, where these things are consolidated, uh, state claims and federal claims are consolidated uh, into uh, federal courts, usually under ancillary jur or diversity jurisdiction, and then judges have to sort out who gets what. And it actually raises the specter of six-fold damages, because under Illinois BRIC, the direct purchaser gets 
the entire overcharge, the indirect purchaser gets nothing. Under a state statute, California, for example, the indirect purchaser can get that portion that's passed on. The federal purchaser still gets the entire, the direct purchaser still gets the entire overcharge. And so you create this situation where <coughs> the direct purchaser gets the entire treble damages award without any pass on. The indirect purchaser then gets everything that's been passed on, and the result is effective damages that are significantly greater than treble damages. Uh, the situation we have is not tenable. Uh, I don't know whether the Supreme Court's going to deal with that or not. I, I will say, I, I read the oral argument, and it looks like uh, Apple's going to be on the losing side of this case unless there's some uh, vote changes along the way. And is Illinois brick going down? I don't think so. Nobody, one brief, and it was the American Antitrust Institute, which does not have a lot of credibility at the Supreme Court, uh, asked for Illinois BRIC to be overruled. But it's not part of the CERT grant, and uh, I, it, it, would be a, it would be kind of a Hail Mary for the Supreme Court to overrule Illinois BRIC based on this litigation and the posture it went up. I agree. <laughs> Um, you, you know, I, I think that's all, all spot on. Uh, a, a couple of things that I think that are, are interesting, I mean, it, it is a, not only is the situation we have found ourselves in with the 25 states and 25 states created, the specter, the specter of sort of 6x damages and some of the places and lots of procedural nightmares. I spend a, a lot of time, um, teaching economics and antitrust to some of those 130 antitrust jurisdictions around the world. And many of those agencies are contemplating whether to be in favor of a system of private rights of action uh, as a more unique than you would think feature of the United States antitrust system, that we have a pretty robust system of private rights of action, both in federal and state antitrust law. And in many of those countries, um, Several times, you know, a dozen at least that I can think of, uh, heads of agencies or legislative bodies have said, "We've thought about leg about the individual rights of rights of action, but look at the nightmare you guys have. Uh, we don't want any part of that. Thanks. The agencies will handle everything." Um, so, I think it's it's interesting because right now is a time in particular that international jurisdictions are are contemplating whether to adopt private rights of action, um, I think is a, a sort of side little interesting point. Um, oftentimes in the United States you have um, the Federal Trade Commission and the Antitrust Division uh, sort of uh, at least trying to openly be on the same page uh, when things go to the Supreme Court uh, one way or another. The Supreme Court will ask for the views of the United States that goes to the DOJ. They will often make a phone call to the FTC saying, FTC, please um, join this brief so we can give a unified sort of answer uh, to the Supreme Court. The, the FTC has been uh, uh, fairly silent, or at least relatively silent on the issue, uh, which is a, a, a growing feature of the modern uh, domestic antitrust landscape. It's sort of a little bit more uh, divergence between agencies has become uh, a little bit more of the norm than usual. Well, to try to give you a flavor of this argument, so let's go to the classic facts of Illinois brick. The brick manufacturer overcharges the whole, the dealer, the dealer then overcharge the contractor, the contractor overcharges the end user. And the question was, you know, at this point only the contractor can sue. And one of the criticisms of Illinois BRIC is, well, suppose the contractor just marked up all the overcharge and passed on all of the money to the consumer. The contractor might have no incentive to sue here financially, and in fact, even if it wins, it gets a windfall because it made the money back from the customer and from the antitrust case. I mean, it gets its cake and eat it too. So that's one of the, the, re the criticisms. The answer has always been a pragmatic one, which is, if we're going to do that game, we're going to have to figure out the damages, which we always do in antitrust law. But we're going to have to apportion how much of it goes to the end user, the customer, how much of it went to the contractor, and that's just too hard. And the question then is, I think that Herb is suggesting, is we're better than that now, and maybe this is an example where economic technique has made it better. And so it's funny, it's, a, it's not a principle, it, the case was never principled, it was pragmatic. 
And so I'd be interested to hear your reaction. But more importantly, if you're both so critical of Illinois BRIC, why isn't getting rid of the whole precedent more on the table? And it seems that we're just going to be uh, rearranging deck chairs on the proverbial di Titanic. Well, maybe the AI was ahead of itself on this one. Incidentally, the, the theory is, is actually very well established. It goes all the way back to the late 19th century, and it has to do with the incidence of taxation, right? Where the question has always been, because governments have a big in, interest in it, when you tax, suppose you tax an input, you tax aluminum, and then uh, a car maker purchases the aluminum and incorporates it in a car, price of the car goes up. Uh, and, and that increment is passed on all the way. And then the question is, uh, who absorbs and who, to what extent is, the, is that increase absorbed by one of these people and to what extent is it, is it passed on? So, so the theory is pretty well understood. The computations are incredibly difficult and particularly, you know, in the case of single shot litigation where you've got to do this for a unique uh, distribution system. Yeah, a, a couple of things on, on that. I think on the pragmatics, I, I, I think what Herb said is absolutely right. So the way that people think about apportionment or pass-through in this context has never been estimating pass-through rates. That is a thing that is uh, exceedingly difficult and when done, usually done through really structural models that assume a lot of things, um, not generating estimates that sort of anybody would be comfortable with, I think, in litigation. And so we've got kind of rougher, rougher readier techniques for trying to estimate these things um, that are used rather than, 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 than pass-through. So I think it is, if the hope is that we, we sort of couldn't estimate pass-through before, but now we can, um, I'll, I'm not much of an optimist. Um, it is interesting to note that there are other places in antitrust where uh, people talk about estimating pass-through. So like the merger guidelines say, we're not going to count all the merger efficiencies. We're going to count those that are passed through to consumers. Um, we don't estimate pass-through either there. I never saw an FTC economist do it when, when, when I was there. Um, it's happened in litigation a couple times. Maybe you've got a you know, a cost reduction for the merged firm, and you could say, look, here's how much it passed through before, um, but it's really not something. It, estimating pass-through rates is something that um, antitrust economists and antitrust lawyers and antitrust agencies talk about a lot, but don't really do. Um, and this is, is, I think, one manifestation of that. Let me just add one other thing, because Justice Kavanaugh cited it in the oral argument, and that is, Section 4 of the Clayton Act, that's the damages provision of the antitrust statute, says any person who shall be injured in his business or property may sue, therefore, and obtain threefold uh, the damages by him or her sustained. Uh, that is to say, it's incredibly broad. Any person who is damaged can sue. Uh, the indirect purchaser rule is a judge-made uh, modification of that statute cut out of whole cloth uh, that, you know, it's, it's blatantly inconsistent with the language of the statute, created purely on, for a policy reason that today seems very, very difficult to justify. Well, thank you. I'd like, thank you. I'd like to shift focus from that case. That was yesterday or more to the point last week. I'd like to, to the future, which is tomorrow. Tomorrow is the oral argument in the AT&T Time Warner Challenge currently going through the courts. For those of you who follow this, AT&T is attempting to acquire, is a network provider attempting to acquire a large movie studio and content producer, Time Warner. Uh, the DOJ challenged this in the court to try to block the merger, the first vertical merger case challenged by the U.S. government in over 40 years. They lost in the district court. It is currently on appeal to the D.C. Circuit, and the oral argument is tomorrow. And the great irony to me is I will be in Washington, D.C., but I will not be at the oral argument because I have to be at another obligation in the federal at the Federal Communications Commission. So, um, Josh, uh, I'd love to start with you since uh, what, do you, what do you think of the, the government, the likely, do you think the district court got it right, and what do you think is going to happen in the Court of Appeals? 
So I'm taking side bets after with anybody <laughs> who wants action on this. Uh, anybody, anytime. Uh, DC Circuit affirms the district court and DOJ loses. Um, what happens after that? Um, I, don't, I don't think the DOJ would fare any better uh, were it to um, petition for cert to the Supreme Court. Um, it might do that. I think it knew the probability of success in front of the DC Circuit was relatively low at the time it decided to appeal. Uh, so maybe probability of success on appeal isn't the only thing in its objective function. Um, so that said, um, so Judge uh, Leon wrote 150 monstrous, uh, you tend to get these in, in, in merger decisions, but um, monstrous opinion. There are more exclamation marks in it than I'm accustomed to for district court opinions. There's a lot of exclaiming um, consistent with the judge's uh, uh, writing style. But um, that decision did a couple of things that I think are interesting. One, so, so yes, I think it is correctly decided um, that the DOJ did not make its, its burden under Section 7 uh, of showing that the transaction was likely, uh, likely anti-competitive. Uh, and that's for a, a number of reasons that I think are interesting. Again, um, like Christopher said, first fully litigated vertical merger case in 40 years. Supreme Court hasn't touched one of these things in a long time. Like Amex, really important conceptually uh, to figure out uh, what the rules are. Um, most of the vertical uh, merger action, whether it's guidelines from agencies or previously litigated cases, are sort of before this big economic revolution uh, that Professor Hovenkamp mentioned uh, earlier. And, you know, the agencies for a decade, I, so when I was there, um, we had a big discussion at the FTC. Are we going to do vertical merger guidelines? We've got this nice set of horizontal merger guidelines informed by modern economics. Should we do that on the vertical side? Um, and the agency, when I, when I was there, decided uh, not to do that, in large part on the idea that we, we maybe brought one or two of them a year. People generally knew how we were going to analyze them. Um, and it was a, a, a big project to undertake uh, for that set of reasons. Um, their current agencies are having that debate again. I believe in another part of sort of bit of interesting divergence. Both agency heads have said that they're going to do vertical merger guidelines. They have also said they're not doing it with the other guy. So there will be two where there was none, which will be great for guidance. Good for, um, law good for lawyers. Good, good work for lawyers. And the coin flip, flip of where your merger is going to end up is going to matter a lot, probably. Um, or more than it does now, if you've got a vertical deal. In any event, uh, high stakes stuff. Uh, but again, and I think like Amex, so, so a couple of facts to sort of uh, um, frame the, the, the discussion. One of the things that happened in the record that I think is really interesting is that the DOJ's expert witness, uh, Carl Shapiro, uh, stipulated on the record, so normally the way, just like we talked about an Amex, slightly different legal structure, but we're going to try to estimate um, any anti-competitive effects that might arise, arise from the merger. Um, the theory of the case was that the merger was going to allow the sort of combined uh, ATT, Time Warner entity, entity extra leverage uh, in bargaining with uh, content providers. It was going to get uh, better input prices and pass those on to consumers. That was sort of the, the story. And the DOJ had a model that tried to estimate what those effects were. Um, if the DOJ satisfies that, that burden, burden sort of shifts to the defendant to say, well, you've got this vertical merger. What are the benefits to consumers that arise from it? The sort of one of the, the sort of first thing in the defendant's playbook for a merger efficiency is our marginal cost savings will happen. The merger will reduce the cost of doing what we're going to do. Um, in the case of vertical mergers, it is uh, eliminating the, you have a firm at one level with some market power, a firm at the next level with market, with market power. They both charge a markup. We merge. We internalize that. We sort of get to uh, reduce or eliminate uh, or reduce double marginalization. This is a claim made in every vertical merger, a pretty sort of uh, common thing uh, to happen. We normally litigate it and fight. Right? The DOJ or the FTC comes on and says, um, we've got some anti-competitive effect. The defense says, but the merger will create a bunch of efficiencies. And the plaintiff in the case, whatever agency, says, uh, nuh -uh, we say efficiencies are zero. Prove it. The expert for the plaintiff, repeat, for the plaintiff, uh, said, 
we can see the benefits from the mergers are something like, um, I'm going to get the number wrong. Do you know what off the top of your head? It's, it was 25 cents a month, maybe? It, it adds up to um, something along. Per customer. Per customer. It adds up to something like $363 million. Um, so it turns out, and this is um, antitrust uh, practice advice for the moment, if you concede benefits of $363 million, you lose your case a lot. And, and that is what happened, right? So they walked in and they said, we concede these as the efficiencies, and can the plaintiff put on evidence of harm greater than that uh, to win? And Judge Leon sort of went through couple of different types of evidence, and I'm going to say sort of again in advance, I, I don't think the opinion's a model of clarity in any stretch of the imagination. I think the, the opinion does a couple of things handling customer, t customer testimony in inconsistent ways. Um, you know, sometimes you believe them about the effects and sometimes you don't. This is a thing that judges uh, often struggle with um, in sort of the internal consistency of using customer testimony to infer likely effects uh, from a merger. So. 150-page opinion, lots of things to like and, and, not, and not to like. Uh, for me, as a guy who does sort of uh, economics of antitrust or sort of led by uh, economics when I think about uh, the doctrine, things I like about the opinion, opinion is focused on oh, exclusively on the anti-competitive effects, right? It is um, not about documents of CEOs saying we're going to take over the world because of the merger, because those happen in every merger. Um, it is focused on the economics. And when the judge looks at the economic evidence put forth by um, the DOJ's expert, Carl Shapiro, he's got a model about how the merger will change the bargaining relationship between the merged firm and uh, HBO, right? Um, or, you know, input providers, content providers, and how those negotiations will come out post-merger and sort of uh, effects that'll be passed through. The judge kicked the tires on that model quite a bit, ended up uh, not believing what was in that model for a variety of reasons. I'm happy to get into if we want to do sort of more, more detail. Um, but a lot of that was uh, amounted or, or occurred because of things that happened in trial, right? So to run these models, you need a bunch of inputs, diversion ratios between the firms, um, you know, how much substitution, how big's the margin, you need lots of these inputs to use the model. And if you go back and look at uh, the transcript of the case, and actually 30 pages of the opinion, our Judge Leon sort of going through these inputs one by one and saying, um, really silly stuff, some of this, but, but, but a real lesson in litigation. Uh, inputs like uh, the diversion ratio used. Well, you use this, did you, you know, Mr. Expert, Dr. Expert, you use this document uh, to you, to, to, use your diversion ratio in the model. Um, did you know there was a later one that had a different number? No. What happens when you use that one? Uh, my result goes away. Um, that's stuff you don't like happening in, in trial. And that happened a, a, a little bit. What also happened, and I, and I think um, there had been a lot of criticism for the way the DOJ lit the, litigated the case for that reason. I think it's something that gets um, not enough attention is the defense expert in the case um, uh, Dennis Carlton, sort of in comparison to the economic testimony that the DOJ put on, which is, we got this theoretical model that spit out a price increase, but we'll spot you $363 uh, million. DOJ needed a lot of things to go right when you spot with certainty $363 million of consumer benefit. And not all the things went right and, and, and they lost, uh, but I think sort of um, one of the things that gets buried is in, in contrast to the sort of uh, I think the judge describes the machinations in the model as a Rube Goldberg contraption at some point, clearly not impressed um, with the sort of technical, mathy elements of, of the model, which, which happens sometimes in court. Uh, the defense expert says, you want to know whether vertical integration uh, between uh, content and distribution changes bargaining incentives. These companies have bought people before. Let's do real empirical stuff and test what happened to prices and we don't get the effects that were predicted by uh, the DOJ's model, which in theory should apply over here too. Um, that I think the judge found, you know, he had one of these, um, you got a theory, I've got to believe all the points uh, in the machine work to believe the estimates. Some of that fell apart. I think the judge was more inclined to take some of this 
I'm a little skeptical of your theory already, and wait a minute, and you're telling me in these four prior transactions we didn't get that kind of vertical leverage effect? Um, gave the judge some comfort in uh, rejecting the plaintiff's theory. Again, I think on the economics, it is the right result. Some stuff in the opinion, um, I think in particular the treatment of, te of customer testimony, um, a little bit less uh, impressive. But I don't think at the DC Circuit, you've got, um, in terms of the underlying economics, the fact finding, and I don't think you've got um, much fodder for reversal. And I think that will be the right result. Herb? Yeah. Um, first of all, the case right now is a procedural mess, both because of some of the things Josh said, also because of some post-acquisition uh, developments. Uh, I participated in a brief for the plaintiffs, and yesterday the D.C. Circuit took the rather unusual step of giving uh, 10 minutes of argument time to a private, not only private, but law professors, if you can think about that, private amicus. So they are going to argue uh, that particular amicus brief. And the reason they're interested in this issue is because the judge credited testimony that... Uh, Time Warner would continue to maximize profits across Time Warner without regard to its the fact that it was now a single entity with AT&T. That is to say that, or to say it a little bit differently, post-merger AT&T would no longer be a profit-maximizing entity because Time Warner would maximize its own profits separately. That represents a destabilizing threat not only to uh, merger law, but to economic analysis generally. That is to say, the only way we get equilibria in markets is if we assume that the firms who are participating are profit maximizers. The reason we have a theory of cartels and a theory of oligopoly for challenging mergers is that we assume uh, that firms are profit maximizers. I mean, are we going to, for example, permit members of a cartel to late some time down the road to defend by saying, well, we're not going to charge our cartel price after we form a cartel. We're going to charge something less, less than that. Uh, so I participated in this brief. The, the brief, incidentally, was not for reversal. It was not, it was in beha not in behalf of either, uh, of either side. There's also some post-acquisition developments that are troublesome, but they raise a difficult legal issue, which is that after the merger, AT&T actually did increase some prices, and it did so by more than Carl Shapiro's model predicted, uh, and it has already engaged in at least one, one blackout, which is uh, a bad outcome aside from price increases. But, I mean, just to get an idea of what's going on here, Time Warner owns uh, Harry Potter, the whole movie series. Very, very valuable uh, asset. Time Warner as a programmer not involved in any kind of cable or satellite company. T Time Ra Warner, as the owner of, of a, a bunch of movie licenses, has an incentive to license to everybody. The more licenses, the better. The marginal cost is zero or very close. Revenue is very high, and so you want to license to everybody. Once Time Warner is owned by a company that owns in this case, DirecTV plus some cable companies, its, its incentives change because now it can use pressure from its ownership of the cable companies and direct TV to do things to competitors like Dish Network, for example, threatening to hold, to withhold Harry Potter, for example, unless it can get its price up. And so in this Nash bargaining model that, that Josh was talking about, uh, post-merger AT&T can use its ownership of, of, of uh, of DirecTV as leverage, and that tilts the bargaining relationship. So the equilibrium bargaining outcome favors higher prices, and if actual blackouts should occur, it will favor loss of programming to some, some customers. Some of that happened subsequent to the acquisition, and that raises a, a pretty uh, gnarly issue for the DC circuit. Number one, post-acquisition evidence is relevant in merger cases. However, 
usually the premise is that the litigation is occurring after the merger. And then you can look at everything in the record up to the time of litigation, even if it was after the merger. This case is a little weird because uh, the case was litigated prior to the merger on the basis of predictions about what would happen. And now that some of these things have come to pass, but after the merger, then the question is, can a court of appeals, whose jurisdiction is usually limited to the record, limited to the district court record, to what extent can the court of appeals rely on developments that occurred subsequent to when the record was closed in order to make this uh, decision? So I'm not going to take Josh's bet. I don't know what the outcome is, is going to be, but I do know there were some very difficult issues in the case that uh, that need to be resolved and I'm particularly worried about this testimony suggesting that the post-merger firm is not going to maximize profits because uh, you know the foundations of neoclassical economics so its whole search for equilibria and its whole predictions of uh, behavior are rest on the assumption of profit maximization and once that goes away then you're dealing with a kind of rank behaviorism where you just don't know what the mo motives are and I hope we don't cross into that territory I agree for what it's worth that part of the opinion is, is uh, horribly written and while I don't necessarily agree that it sort of wholesale endorses the abandoning of neoclassical economics um, it's not well drafted and it's not helpful um, but I don't think that the DC Circuit needs a single sentence of it to review the record in the case on the relevant legal issue um, I, I do hope that it would be nice if they would clean that bit up on the way to affirming but uh, again you want action on the case you know where to find me <laughs> so what I find fascinating I have a question for the Herb. Was the new evidence done, it's after merger, was it done before, did it come in before or after the district court decision? I think after. That's a real problem. Because then there's it's a, a problem. question. No, it's a problem for an appellate, for appellate. Because the DC, uh, appellate courts can't do new fact finding. And they're bound by the record produced by the district court. And so even if they know it to be true, the vehicle, and once it becomes law of the case or res judicata in that case, it becomes much, much harder to undo unless someone goes back to the district court and goes for a new fact. It's, it's I don't think res judicata would apply if the new challenge is strictly based on the post-acquisition evidence. That would be a different set of facts. But the remedy, it's, you, you don't really don't see those challenges because the remedies of undoing a merger are so complicated, but if it's still pending on cert, then you've got more, it's fascinating. Right. So, I mean, the thing that I have to really, it blows me away, though, is the granting of a motion for a amb separate amicus to give an oral, participate in an oral argument three days before the oral argument. And by 37 law professors, I've never We're heard We're not of all going to argue. Well, I hope, <laughs> well no. I'm sure you all each. argue, not just in, front, just not in front of the D.C. Circuit. That's a faculty meeting. Um, you know, but it's... I've never heard of anything like that before. I mean, it made me just reflect my own myopia, but... And it's interesting, there, were, there was a 27 law professor brief on the other side, and AT&T, when they granted the merger, the, the motion said, if you're gonna give them time, you should give these other people time, and the DC Circuit said yes and no. I mean, I was, I could, I would thought it was in, unlikely that they would grant anyone, they hate granting amicus separate time to argue. They almost never do it. And if they were gonna do it on one side, they should probably do, I mean, technically it's favoring either party, but yeah, on balance. People have no financial interest yeah. in the case. So the question is, why wouldn't they, and that they, I would assume if they grant it to one side, they grant it to both. Are, is this, am I wrong to be as surprised as I am? I was surprised. It's, it's bizarre. It's a very highly non-standard development. And it's, there's more to this case than meets the eye. That is obvious. And there's more going on than meets the eye. So I'm going to pivot a little bit also now, one of the reasons this case is so interesting is the received wisdom of the last, oh, 50 years of economics is that vertical coordination, whether it's vertical integration or more commonly vertical restraints, is probably less problematic than we thought. So we've had all these pre say rules in vertical cases, and they've one by one taken, been take, removed. 
The only one left is a nominal one against tying, and it's so complicated, it's not clear, and it's not even clear if that's vertical or single firm conduct, so set that to one side. And everyone was wondering if this merger marked a renaissance or a sea change in how we're going to look at vertical integration, which takes me right into the debate ongoing about what is sometimes called neo-Brandeisian, or as Josh has more, pop more commonly popularized it, hipster antitrust, which is a call to say that we should move away from the consumer welfare standard that has been the primary focus of both Herb's and Josh's comments to a more pluralistic vision of antitrust that would take into account other presumably uh, non-economic considerations. You could say other economic considerations, but I most, think most economists say they have no problem with that more complex models, they really want to change the focus of antitrust law. And um, I've seen a lot of uh, press about this, this is the New York Times and a lot of attention. I'd be curious to hear both of your reactions to the advocacy that is quite noisy and getting a lot of attention on Capitol Hill in a lot of circles in favor of moving away from the consumer welfare standard. After you, sir. <laughs> uh, it's your house. Uh, okay. Uh, <laughs> The press always likes the extremes. I'll start out with that. Uh, the problem with technical antitrust is it's a little too dull or too complicated for the press. And so, uh, yes, the antitrust right gets extra attention and the antitrust left gets extra attention. I predict that uh, neo-Brandeisian antitrust is going to be relegated to kind of a noisy, small, and fairly inconsequential fringe group that never has any significant impact on either Congress or, uh, or, the, federal, or the federal courts. Uh, if their proposals are implemented, or at least in their current form, I think the result could be dramatically higher prices. I mean, you know, they go after companies like Amazon and Google uh, who, who might be committing a lot of sins, but high prices is not generally among them. Uh, and if you go through, you know, go through a company like Amazon with a sledgehammer uh, and try to knock down all of the things it's doing, yeah, there might be a few small businesses who are injured, although by and large not. Uh, by and large, you don't see a lot of small businesses complaining about Amazon. Customers are certainly not complaining. Uh, uh, so, so I just don't see it going anywhere. I hope the Democrats don't decide to take this up and carry this banner because if, if, if it happens and the impact is dramatically higher prices, it's going to be Democrat constituencies that are going to end up paying for it. That is to say, people that don't have a lot of money that depend heavily on low prices and I think the duty of the antitrust laws is to keep output up and prices down. That sound more like a sermon than a... It was a great sermon. Um, <laughs> and, and, and I agreed with every word. Um, so I think, I think that's right. I mean, just to get a, a, a sense, I mean, some of the proposals, so antitrust adopts what we, we call the consumer welfare standard. It's an economic welfare standard where whatever we're talking about, any of the subjects we talked about today, mergers, conduct, contracts, the question um, and the analysis is always around whether consumers are being made better or worse off. Um, whether we're talking about output or prices or innovation, et cetera. And this sort of group of proposals um, in the sort of hipster antitrust neo Brandeisian uh, um, sort of circle that have been raised are the consumer welfare standard has hijacked antitrust and is sort of it's a asleep at the wheel not doing its 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 job and so what we ought to do is throw out um, the sort of economics based welfare analysis that has been the lodestar of antitrust for uh, now quite some time and replace it with what exactly? And there's a variety of different proposals, but they all run something like um, we should have uh, arbitrary bright line limits on firm size. Uh, we should ban vertical integration 
regardless of its effects, right? So we have this fight over ATT Time Warner, but one of the positions is um, just no vertical integration at all. Um, uh, one is there's a proposed bill that one of these groups endorsed that said um, no horizontal mergers at all uh, if the assets of the firms are greater than some sort of fixed dollar amount. So lots of stuff, and, and most of it is not not new uh, in the sense of the ideas are new. Most of them are, I guess, maybe um, as is sort of tipped off by the neo-Brandeisian, um, the sort of um, the name that they have, have given themselves. I think hipster antitrust is catchier. Um, but they have said, uh, most of these are ideas that the antitrust folks debated in the 60s and 70s uh, when antitrust did have a non-economic welfare standard. And they said, well, you know, those debates were had, and antitrust has been sort of on a path to improve economic tools to sort of do the job better, and there are places where it functions pretty well now. There are places where I would do it better or would do it better um, or would change what they, do, what they do or have some criticisms on the margin. But I think within um, a mainstream antitrust right, center left, the view has been tethering antitrust to the economic welfare standard has been a good thing relative to where antitrust was sort of 1890 to you know, late, teen, late 1960s. Uh, and so the one thing that has been interesting is these critiques have gotten not a lot of, uh, not a great amount of, not a lot of voices in academia, one or two, um, but lots of press. I mean, New York Times profiles left and right and uh, things of that, of that nature. Lots of sort of public intellectual stuff. Um, play on the hill from senators on both sides um, because it is a little bit more politically salient today whether you're left on right to sort of scream something about Google or Amazon uh, or pick your large tech firm of your, your, your choosing, Facebook, um, something like that. I think that's been an argument that's more politically salient on both sides and that's feeding some of the fire. Um, but one of the really cool things about antitrust uh, institutions has been Antitrust has evolved significantly over time, and that path of evolution has always has been sort of um, more economics, not less. It has been more sensitive to empirical evidence about claims, right? So our treatment of vertical mergers is much different now than it was, in large part guided by study of vertical mergers and what they do. Um, the same for horizontal merger analysis. We used to do a lot of counting firms on our fingers to predict whether prices would go up or down. Economics does a better job of developing tools for prediction. Right? The evolution has been, hey, more of those tools, less of your fingers. Um, it's not gone as far as I would like that evolution, but the, the, the direction of the path is pretty clear. Um, I don't think there are a lot of examples um, in modern antitrust of sustained, successful attempts to move against that grain. First things happen all the time. This could, this could be it, but I'm sort of with Herb on uh, the prediction that ultimately uh, this movement fails to get any traction. I, I think before it fails, I've got a paper that says it's gonna fail. I think the title is this movement will fail or something like that. Um, I'm not good at titles. Um, but, but, but Google it and download it. I'm paid by the download. Um, but I think it will fail largely because antitrust institutions, the reason that they um, are reluctant to move sort of against that grain is it's been a successful thing for antitrust agencies, for courts. Um, and I think that that trend will, will continue because I think a lot of the, um, a lot of the claims, one of them, uh, uh, all mergers above uh, the sort of the 1968 merger guidelines said you're in trouble if the post-merger share is above 10%. Uh, so if you, I don't have the uh, big enough calculator to run this, but sort of as an exercise, if you changed all firm size to 10, you'd have to define all the markets. It'd be a long project and a lot of economists would make a lot of money. Uh, but if you sort of reduced all firms to 10% share, the welfare losses would be... It, the Great Depression. I mean, the welfare losses would be monumental. And that's their worst idea, and so I'm picking on it, right? Um, but there are other bad ones, too. So, you know, I think moving those institutions is certainly not going to happen through the courts. Um, 
you know, if the leader of one of these movements was, you know, the head of the antitrust division tomorrow, I don't know what you could do. You could bring cases into federal courts where you're going to lose. Uh, so I think you'll see this mostly play out, not in the courts and not even in antitrust academia, but really um, in lobbying for some of these changes. And I, I'm, I am hopeful, uh, like Herb, that they're not successful, and I, th I do not think they will be, only because, um, you know, consumers stand to be made people stand to be made a lot more poor uh, by some of those proposals. Well, I think that I, I hear a lot of consensus around that. Let me change the word hipster or Neil Brandeisian to a different word. Fairness. Uh, this is getting a lot of traction in Europe. If you look at enforcement agencies around the world, whether it's Japan, Korea, Taiwan, they all have FTCs, but the F is not federal, it's fair, and they take it seriously. Um, what your comments suggest is, what does that say about the move in many jurisdictions to introduce fairness as an idea that is very consciously a marked departure from just taking economic considerations into account? Well, first of all, you need a criterion for defining fairness. And it can mean almost anything, depending on what your perspective is and who you think is getting harmed by a, a certain process. And so it's really uh, an invitation to po political chaos. Uh, you need to, you know, who, who are we protecting that is going to be benefited by this fairness? And uh, until we get to that point, I'm, I don't really, I'm not really ready to assert any position on it. I just don't, I don't even know what it means. Yeah, so I, I spend a lot of time in those jurisdictions that you that you mentioned, um, where fairness is in the title of the agency or um, in the operative substantive statute, the word fairness appears. Um, the United States Federal Trade Commission has an unfair methods of competition authority assigned to it, um, where it has taken a stand on giving criteria to what fairness means. And it has said, essentially, you can have uh, kind of a, an ex-ante brand of fairness, we're here to uh, protect the competitive process. As long as the competitive process is fair, the outcomes that flow from it, we don't uh, sort of ex post regulate the distribution of outcomes. We regulate the competitive process. That's one view. I think that's the view the U.S. Federal Trade Commission took in interpreting its own unfair methods of competition. It basically said, this is like the antitrust laws, right? We're going to do welfare-based analysis and not other things. Um, in other jurisdictions, I think it remains an open question. Um, but I think, sort of li like Herb, I think there are lots of places where um, discussing the type of criteria, you know, how one defines uh, un you know, fairness matters quite a bit. It matters in the IP and antitrust context where most of these disputes are licensing disputes over a royalty rate. And you have antitrust authorities coming in and saying, you struck a bargain. I don't. I don't like the bargain. The price isn't right. U.S. courts have been, um, in antitrust cases, at least um, allergic, mostly allergic to that kind of thing. Um, a little bit less so in foreign jurisdictions, uh, but many of them. You take, for example, uh, China. So, um, the new Chinese antitrust agency has a, sort of an open session on exactly this question right now which is they want to put out some guidelines for those criteria. I think um, when China does that, a bunch of other jurisdictions will. So it remains, I think, a really important question. I am uh, somewhat hopeful that those jurisdictions will follow the U.S. lead, uh, if not only because I think the ex post criteria for unfairness are... Um, I've got a 12-year-old and a 10-year-old. I hear about fairness all the time. It's a fair, I'm not sure that there is an objective measure that I can see working in a, a system that maintains the rule of law, m much like my household lacks it. Well, every child has a very simple definition of fairness. Whatever disadvantages that child is inherently unfair, so it's quite simple. Um, at this point, I'm, I'd love to open the floor to any questions that anyone might have. I can't let the opportunity of two such distinguished scholars pass without at least giving people the opportunity to ask them anything that might be on their minds. Please. No, 
I think most of the issues are going to pertain to information technologies rather than heavier industries. Problems related to networking, problems uh, related to regarding information as a sellable or tradable uh, commodity, uh, problems related to standard setting and uh, compatibility among uh, technologies where sometimes technolo uh, offerers can get excluded. Uh, but I think that area writ large is going to produce a disproportionate share of litigation. I think classical, the kind of the classical core of antitrust a generation ago, which was distribution, distribution of hard products, I think that day is over. It's very little of that that's going to go on. There's going to be some continued litigation and exclusive dealing, a little bit in tying, not very much in resale price maintenance and probably none in non-price restraints. I think vertical mergers is going to be an expansion area, era, area but I think it's going to be limited to uh, technologies that involve a significant informational component. We're not going to see cases like the last vertical merger case that was litigated, Freehoff, involved the relationship between a truck manufacturer and a manufacturer of truck parts, like wheels and brakes. Those kinds of cases are rarely going to pose challenges. On the other hand, cases like Time Warner, where you've got uh, a good that is non-rivalrous, it can be licensed out a very large number of times and then vertical structures put constraints on that. I think that that will be an avenue of future expansion. I think I agree with, with all of that. I will say um, two things. One, I don't think the retail cases are ever going away. Um, so I think that's one area of the traditional core that's going to stay around for a long time one way uh, or another. An area where I think, um, I think this is sort of answering the question, but uh, an area where I think there will be a lot of antitrust activity, sort of more and more the important question posed to antitrust authorities or, or courts or whomever, um, is less I've got five guys competing in a market. If they merge, how's competition going to change? And a little bit more uh, because the scarce asset, the asset that's giving a firm its competitive advantage, is not its manufacturing process, but its human capital. It's got a bunch of engineers in the room that can do a lot of different smart things, um, and they can deploy them in a lot of places, different ways, quickly. Um, that's a bear for market definition in antitrust. So if the really important question, we're, we're always looking in antitrust for where the competitive constraint is, right? So after the merger, can this firm raise price? Depends on if there are enough competitive constraints to stop it. A lot of antitrust tools are, you know, Coca-Cola merges with another soda firm. I look, you know, can Pepsi constrain the price? I know who the constraints are. In a lot of information technology uh, applications of antitrust, I don't know. More often, the constraint is somebody who is not in the market today, not thinking about being in the market today, but could be tomorrow um, or next week if, uh, if the opportunity arose. Uh, this sort of idea is, and antitrust often refer to this as nation competition, right? The guy's not a substitute today, but he could be tomorrow. Um, and where human capital is the scarce asset for the firm's competitive advantage or data, um, that, I think, is an area where talked about all these sort of antitrust tools on the demand side where we get to estimate effects and it's better than using our fingers. One place where antitrust economics has not developed sort of quite as uh, nicely is on the supply side, sort of uh, firm dynamics of entry and exit. And I think that's going to be a really big challenge for the antitrust institutions, the economists and the lawyers, um, not just how to get those economics right, but how to do that in a way where they can be operationalized. It's not just the economics, but the law and economics, getting those things operationalized into antitrust institutions. Most of the entry debates at sort of at the agency level are the same way you would have talked about entry in the 60s, and are barriers high or low, right? And that's sort of not good enough, um, not nuanced enough to answer some of these questions. So I think that's where a lot of the investment and activity will go to try to deal with some of these changes. Yeah, let me add one other thing. I was just thinking of it as Josh was talking, and that's labor. Uh, 
I think I think labor and antitrust is going to be a growth area. You know, at the beginning of the history of antitrust, laborers were antitrust violators. Today, we think of them as victims. Uh, there's a lot of literature. It comes from both the left and the right. Mr. Delarim uh, has spoken out on this issue now two or three times. He's the head of the antitrust division. But markets are smaller. Uh, mergers, many mergers, particularly in industries like hospitals, are having adverse consequences in labor markets. And those are markets where there's not ancillary protection from regulatory provisions. You know, we, we say, well, we're not too concerned about health care pricing in a concentrated ho hospital market uh, because we've got big government buyers and so on keeping prices down. Nobody's looking out for the wages of nurses. And if uh, two hospitals in a relatively small community merge, so we suddenly have a monopoly purchaser of nursing services, then nursing wages will go down. And there's been a lot of work on this issue, and I think there's going, it has some traction and it will probably go somewhere in the future. One last question for Professor Jung. Well, uh, I'm, I'm going to say a couple of things and turn it over to Josh, but everybody involved in this case currently is opposed to behavioral remedies. Uh, that is to say it's either structural or nothing. So that's kind of where I think we're sitting right now. Uh, the government loses, as Josh predicts, and of course there won't be a remedy. If the government wins, the judge said from the bench that the D.C. Circuit would not hesitate to provide a structural remedy if there was a reversal. I'm not sure that's true, but I would think uh, it would have to be some kind of structural remedy. Now, keep in mind that structural remedy doesn't necessarily mean a full and complete divestiture. Non-exclusive non licensing can be a structural remedy. A partial asset spinoff can be a structural remedy. Uh, but uh, I don't see a lot of people looking for behavioral remedies at this stage. The head of the antitrust division moved to the corner of the room, painted himself into it, and then said, I will never do anything other than a full structural remedy. Um, so that's what you're going to get if you win. Uh, I don't think there's any way to do anything different. Um, I don't, yeah. I, that said, I, I said I think they're going to lose, so... I won't uh, spend too much time talking about the remedies, but I, I don't see how, um, given the way the cards have been played so far, that conditional on a DOJ win, you get anything other than a full structural remedy. Well, this has been a fascinating discussion. Please join me thanking Professor Huffington, Professor Wright for a, a great evening. This is uh, just the beginning of a conversation. We will have a reception outside where if you'd like to talk to them further, I'm sure they'd be happy to engage with you and discuss whatever questions you may have.